Okay, so um, in my last lecture, I talked about the decoder. So what is an encoder? The encoder performs the opposite operation of a decoder. Okay, so it has two to the power n inputs. You can see here the number of inputs. And the number of outputs is only n. It is just the opposite of the uh, decoder. The decoder had n inputs and two to the power n outputs. Here we have two to the power n inputs and only n outputs. So that's the, uh, the encoder. Now, a restriction about the encoder is that this is a binary encoder. Uh, you must have exactly one input should be equal to one, and all the remaining inputs should be zeros. So that's the case of an encoder. One input should be one, and all the other inputs must be zeros. And the output will be the binary code that indicates that which input is equal to a one. Okay, that's uh, basically how we produce the output of the encoder. an example of an 8 to 3 binary encoder. So notice that here we have eight inputs, okay, which are numbered from 0 to 7. So I'm calling them D0, D1, up to D7. And there are only three outputs. Okay, you can see these actually are my three outputs, A2, A1, and A0. So the output is a binary code. So this is called an encoder because it is generating a binary code and this binary code is going to indicate that which input is a one. Yani for example, if D0 is equal to a one, then you get the output 0, 0, 0 in binary. So that indicates that input 0 is a one. If input D1 is equal to one, you get the output 0, 0, 1. That indicates that D1 is one. If D2 equal to one, you get 0, 1, 0. 0, 1, 0 in, in binary is the number 2, okay, indicating that input 2 is equal to A1. You can go all the, all the way here to D7. Okay, so if D7 equal to 1, you get the output is equal to 1, 1, 1, indicating that input D7 is equal to A1. I'm showing it like this. You can just reverse the order of the inputs. It does not really matter. So, uh, so that's my truth table for a, uh, a binary encoder. So it has eight inputs, it has three outputs. One of the inputs should be equal to one and all the remaining inputs must be zeros. And the output is going to encode in binary that which input is a one. Um, now, one problem okay, with the binary encoder is that it will not really work properly if you have more than one input is one. If you have more than one input is one, then the output is not specified. Okay, so you must have exactly one of the inputs is equal to a one. Because if you have more than one input equal to one, then the output will be typically wrong. Okay, so um, you say, okay, what is the, re why, why do we need actually a binary encoder? Well, that might be useful. Okay, in some uh, problems. But let us have actually a good understanding of the encoder first. Um, so we can use, so remember that uh, the encoder is just the opposite of the decoder. And for example, I might have a decoder here, and this decoder has three inputs, A2, A1, A0. So these actually are my inputs, so they are numbered from two down to zero. These are my inputs. It has seven outputs from zero to seven. The encoder will have, uh, it will have, sorry, eight outputs, which are numbered from zero to seven. In the case of the encoder, it will have also eight inputs. So we can connect the output of the decoder to the inputs of the encoder. So this will be four, five, six, and seven. So you can take the outputs of the decoder and connect them to the inputs of the encoder. So for example, if uh, the input is 0, 1, 0, then the output 2 will be equal to 1. All the remaining outputs will be zeros. That's in the case of the decoder, because the decoder is going to have exactly one of its outputs is equal to 1, and all the remaining outputs are zeros. So if we connect 
the outputs of the decoder as inputs to the encoder, then we'll have exactly one of the inputs. So the encoder is equal to one and all the remaining inputs are zeros. Now what the encoder will do is going to produce a binary code. So this code here will be in binary 0, 1, 0. 0, 1, 0 in binary means 2. It means that input 2 is equal to a 1. Okay. So notice that when you take your input here, okay, to the decoder, decoded and then encoded, you will get exactly, so you will get the same, the output which is identical to the input of the decoder. So this is why we say that the encoder performs the opposite operation or the inverse operation of a decoder. Okay, is this clear? So now we understand what a decoder does and we understand what the encoder does. Okay, so basically the encoder performs the inverse operation of the decoder. Students, questions? Five. Uh, let us see how we implement an encoder. So this is an 8 to 3 binary encoder. So I say 8 to 3 because we have 8 inputs and we have 3 outputs. Okay, so that's why it's called 8 to 3 binary encoder. So these are my inputs, which are numbered from 0 to 7. So these are D0 to D7. And these are my outputs. Notice that output 2 is shown on top here because I would like to say that uh, this is a binary code. Okay, so A2 is the most significant bit and uh, A0 is the least significant bit. So it's 2 down to 0 for the output. Now we know from the truth table of the binary encoder, right? So we, I'm just copying it here. So we have three outputs here, A2, A1, A0. So all what I need is just the equations for A2, for A1, and for A0. In fact, this truth table is so simple because we have exactly one of the inputs is equal to A1, and all the remaining inputs are zeros. So for this reason, we only have eight entries inside this truth table. The remaining entries are not being shown because we are assuming we are putting a restriction that exactly one of the inputs is one. So we cannot really have two inputs are equal to one, two or more inputs are equal to one. So for this reason, I'm not really, I'm, I'm showing only eight possible uh, inputs. Um, so the equations become very simple. Okay, for example, if I would like to focus on A2, A2 is equal to one only in these four entries of the truth table. So either we have D4 equal to 1, or D5 equal to 1, or D6 equal to 1, or D7. So I can just write it like this. This is my output A2. It will be a 4 input or gate. It's very simple. That's here is the output A2. For A1, we have these four cases. So either we have D2 or D3, or we have D6 or we have D7. So we can write it like this. This is A1. And finally, for A0, we also have these four cases. So we can write the equation for A0 as D1 or D3 or D5 or D7. You see how simple they are? So these are my equations for A2, for A1, and for A0. And we can draw. OK, the 8 to 3 binary encoder, we can implement it using only three four input OR gates. So here we have three gates, three OR gates, and each gate has four inputs. OK, so these are four input OR gates, and this will give me the output A2, A1, and A0. So that's my 8 to 3 binary encoder, which is implemented using three Four input OR gates. Questions about this? OK. Now, what is the problem with the binary encoder? We put a restriction on the inputs, right? We said that exactly one input must be one. At all time, at any time. 
and all the others must be zeros. That actually was a major restriction on the inputs of the binary encoder. By what if we have more than one input is one? So we have to ask ourselves this question. What will be the output? Well, the output will be typically incorrect. For example, suppose that we have D3 and D6 are both equal to one. Well, if D6 is equal to one, then A2 will be equal to one. If D3 or D6 equal to one, we get A1 equal to one. And here, if D3 equal to one, we get A0 equal to one, because these are OR gates. So you get the output to be one, one, one. But one, one, one means that D7 equal to one. So here we got an incorrect output. So the output is incorrect. So if you have two or more inputs are equal to A1, typically you will get an incorrect output. Because we said that one of the conditions, okay, uh, for, uh, so we, we placed a restriction on the inputs of the binary encoder is that you must have one of its inputs to be equal to one, exactly one input. So if you have two inputs are equal to one at the same time, then typically the output will be incorrect. So the equations will not really work and therefore you will get wrong output. So now we have two problems to resolve. The first problem is that if I would like to design a special encoder in which we have two or more inputs are equal to one at the same time, what should be the output? This is the first question to ask. I mean, we have, this is the first question to, or the first problem to resolve. Okay, so we need to address this problem. There is a second problem, which is what if all the inputs are zeros? Well, if all the inputs are zeros, according to this equation, you will get A2, A1, A0 are all zeros. But if the output is 0, 0, 0, it indicates that D0 equal to 1. But now if you have actually all the inputs are zeros, we are going to get the same output here, which is 0, 0, 0. So now this is actually is ambiguity. So we have to resolve this ambiguity. So what should be the output? if all the inputs are all zeros, okay? Uh, I cannot just use zero, zero, zero because zero, zero, zero indicate that input D zero equal to one. It's going to encode that input D zero equal to one. So for this reason, we need to modify, okay, the encoder design. Okay, so we have these two problems to resolve. I'm going to show you how we resolve these two problems. OK, but do you have any questions so far? Do you understand this topic? Is this clear? Anyone has a question? You are very silent today. No questions? Do I just move on? Are you still present? <laughs> yani, don't leave your computers and go somewhere else. Just uh, pay attention to this lecture and raise questions now. Um, uh, I cannot that? see you. I can ask you to turn on your cameras if you want. OK, I'm not asking you to do this. OK, um, I know that <laughs> some OK faculty members might ask the students to turn on their cameras. OK, just to be interactive. We're not interacting much yani, in this course. And this is not, this is not good. Yani. By the way, if you don't raise questions, you don't actually interact. You don't really learn much from the course. I don't really know what is really happening, but I don't really feel that you are learning. I know that actually I have top students, excellent students. I have few students who actually have yani, got above 90% in the midterm exam. I can actually say that very clearly from now. But what about the rest? Why you are not, the exam was not really that difficult. Did you find the midterm exam difficult? Please let me know. Did you find the midterm exam difficult? Was it that difficult? Well, it was simple and easy. I, I don't really hear your feedback. No one would like to talk. Right, OK. Uh, let us move on. So now, in order to resolve these two problems of the encoder, we need something new, which is called priority encoder. So the priority encoder is going to eliminate the two problems of the binary encoder that we have seen so far. In the case of the binary encoder, we had a restriction. 
that we have to have exactly one of the inputs should be one and all the remaining inputs are zeros. If I would like to go back to this slide. Now notice that we have eight inputs. OK, from D7 down to D0, or we can say from D0 to D7, it does not really matter. So we had eight inputs. But if I have a truth table, if I have a combinational circuit that has eight inputs, how many possible combinations can I get with these eight inputs? Now, this is a question to you. I need to hear you. 256. 256. 256. Thank you, Hamma. 2 to the power 8 is equal to 256. So this, if this is actually was a normal truth table, I must have 256 possible entries. OK, I'm only showing here eight entries. Why? Because I made a restriction that exactly one of the inputs is one and all the remaining inputs are zeros. So these are only eight cases or eight possible combinations and the rest is not really shown. So this is why I said that the binary encoder has limitations. So the limitation here is that I'm not really dealing with all cases. In order to deal with all these cases, I need to deal with 256 cases. OK, because we can have 256 possible combinations of these eight inputs. OK, so for this reason, we have to say what will be the output if you have more than one input is one at the same time. What will happen if all my inputs are zeros? These are the questions or these are the problems that need to resolve. So for this reason, we need to define something new, which is called the priority encoder. So the priority encoder deals with these two problems. Here's an example about a 4 to 2 priority encoder. So in the case of a priority encoder, we are going to rank the inputs from the highest priority to the lowest priority. OK. So suppose that we say that D3 has the highest priority and D0 has the lowest priority. OK. Then <clears throat> in this case, if you have more than one input, is active, yeah, and it is one at the same time, then we use the priority to indicate what should be the output. Yeah, and for example, if D3 is equal to one, now D3 has the highest priority. I really don't care about D2, D1, and D0. So notice that I'm putting don't cares. So D2, D1, D0 can be anything from 0, 0, 0 to 1, 1, 1. It does not really matter. Because D3 is equal to 1, then the output here will be 1, 1, indicating that the input is that which is active is D3. So 1, 1 here is going to encode the input D3. OK, so that's the binary encoding of the input D3. And I'm indicating here that my output is valid. I'm using an extra output here, which is B. I'll mention why we need this extra output. So this extra output indicate that the output here is valid. Right. If D3 equal to 0 and D2 is equal to 1. Now D2 is the second highest priority, then I don't care about D1 and D0. That can be anything from 0, 0 to 1, 1. Notice that the output here is 2 in binary. It's 1, 0 in binary, indicating that D2 is equal to 1. So that will be the highest priority input that which is equal to 1. If we have 0, 0, 1, then the output will be 0, 1. And if we have 0, 0, 0, 1, then the output will be 0, 0, indicating that D0 is equal to 1. Notice that in all of these cases, the output is valid. If all the inputs are zeros, then the output will be invalid. So I'm going to indicate that V equal to zero, indicating that the output is invalid, and we don't really care about what is the output A1 and A0. OK, so now this is actually is a complete truth table for my priority encoder. So we have to add this valid output to indicate whether the output is valid or not, and to handle the case, 
when all the inputs are all zeros. So for this reason, we have this valid output. So V will be equal to zero, indicating that the output is invalid if all my inputs are zeros. Otherwise, my, out, my V out will be equal to one. So if at least one of the inputs is one, then the output will be valid. And the output will be encoded according to the input that has the highest priority, which is equal to one. That's why it's called a priority encoder. So you can have more than one input equal to one at the same time, and the output will encode the input that has the highest priority, which is equal to one. Okay, is this clear? So this is the meaning of the priority encoder. Now notice that when I put here, I can put don't case in my inputs. So notice that here, for example, when D3 is equal to one, this last entry here, I'm putting here D2, D1, D0, R0, 0, 0, 0. Sorry, they are actually X, 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 my mistake. So these are three don't cares. So I put here that I don't care about D2, I don't care about D1, and I don't care about D0. In other words, D2, D1, D0 can be anywhere from 0, 0, 0 to 1, 1, 1. So we have eight possible combinations of D2, D1, and D0 when D3 is equal to 1. So for this entry here, when D3, the last entry, which is shown as D3 equal to 1, I don't really care about D2, D1, D0. So we have eight possible combinations. So this row in the truth table will be, we can actually expand it into eight rows because we have three don't cares in the inputs. We can actually use any possible value of these inputs. And therefore, this row will be equivalent to eight rows in a normal truth table. Yeah, if I would like to count this uh, last entry here, this will be, in fact, eight rows. Why? Because we have three don't cares in the inputs. So we can actually have eight possible combinations of these inputs. Here we have two don't care, so this will be equivalent to four rows. Here we have one don't care, so therefore this will be two rows. This is one and this is one. If you add them up, you get one plus one equal to two, plus two equal to four, plus four equal to eight, plus eight equal to 16. So you get actually 16 entries. But this, this truth table is condensed because we are using don't cares in the inputs. So do you understand this concept? The idea of using here don't cares in the inputs is that to have a more condensed truth table. So rather than actually drawing a large truth table that having 16 combinations of D3, D2, D1, D0, I'm using a condensed truth table, okay? That contains exactly the same information. Fine. So this is the truth table of a priority encoder. Good, all right. So um, let us move on. How do we implement this priority encoder? We have the truth table. We can just use the Carnot maps. Okay, so the, the equations here are not really obvious. So what we need is that we need an equation for A1. I need an equation for A0. And I need an equation for V. So what I need is that I need a Carnot map for A1, I need a Carnot map for A0, and I need a Carnot map for V. In fact, V is very simple because there is only one case, it is zero. And all the remaining 15 cases are all ones. So we have 16 entries in this truth table, but it is condensed. I'm showing them as if they were actually five, but these actually are 16. So there is only one case in which it is zero and all the remaining cases are all ones. So the equation will be very trivial, very simple in the case of V. I can just use an OR gate, a four input OR gate for V. If any input is one, you get one. If all the inputs are zeros, you get zero. So that will be an OR gate, a four input OR gate. That will be V. But the equations for A1 and A0 are not obvious. So therefore, we need to use the Carnot map to obtain the equations for A1 and for A0. Like for A1, let us take a look here at the Carnot map for A1. So for A1, we are getting a don't care here, right? So if you have actually here four, if you have the inputs are all zeros. So we are here in this box, then we put a don't care. 
Here we have zeros. We don't really have to. We can focus on the ones. So these actually will be like zero entries in the Carnot map. Here I have a one, and here I have a one. Now let us take a look at this green one. So this is actually when d3 equal to zero and d2 equal to one. And I don't really care about d1 and d0. So this is d3 equal to zero and d2 equal to one. And d1 and d0 can be anything. So basically we have four entries in the Carnot map that are equal to one. I'm showing them as just a single one in the truth table. But because we have don't cares for D1 and D0, these will be four ones in the Carnot map. Let us take a look at this one here, this last one. Notice that D3 equal to one, and I don't really care about D2, D1, and D0. So we have three don't cares in the inputs. So these will be actually eight cases. So I'm showing that here that D3 equal to one. And we don't really care about D2, D1, and D0. So these are eight cases that we have in the Carnot map. So this is how I fill the Carnot map from this condensed truth table. Of course, we can expand it into 16 and this, this truth table. It will become very clear to us. But I'm just showing to you how we can actually fill this Carnot map from this condensed truth table. We can do the same thing here okay, for A0. So we need another Carnot map for A0. So this was for A1. I need another one for A0. So again, the same thing here in the case of these eight entries. Okay, because uh, the, this is this one here will be these eight ones in the Carnot map. I also have this one here. So these are these two ones. And here I have a don't care that appears here in the case of 0, 0, 0, 0. So we have the Carnot maps for A1 and for A0. Let me clean up this. Uh, Think that I have. And now I can actually just use the Carnot map for simplification. So I can obtain the equation for A1 and I can obtain the equation for A0. So we can write the expression for A1 and we can write the expression for A0. They are very simple. And finally, I can write the expression here for V. Notice that V is just a four input OR gate, as we have seen, okay, from the truth table. So these are the expressions, okay? These are the output expressions for A1 and for A0 and for V. And I can just draw the circuit diagram, okay? So notice that A1 here, it is just a two input OR gate. In the case of A0, we have either D3 or we have here, this is D1 and D2 prime. So this is actually my two input AND gate. We have an inverter here and we have a two input OR gate. And finally, for V, we are just, it's a four input orbit. So this is the implementation of a four to two priority encoder. So notice that these are my inputs here. And these are my three outputs. And this is the circuit diagram for a four to two priority encoder. So we have implemented the four to two priority encoder using just normal gates and or and inverters, that's it. OK, so now we understand how we can implement a 4 to 2 priority encoder, and we can just use it in circuit uh, design. I will show you later next week, inshallah, how we can actually design. We can actually have different design examples, how we can start using this as a blocks in our design. Right, let us move on. Let me talk about multiplexes. But before I move on, do you have any question about this? Is this clear? Right, no problem. OK, let us move on. So I'm going to assume that you understand everything. OK. Um, multiplexers. Let us talk about multiplexers. Now, multiplexers are really very useful and very essential OK, components that we can use in digital circuits. OK, so people use, uh, yani they are used for selection. So if you would like to select data, use a multiplexer. Uh, so people use, okay, so for example, when I'm designing a CPU, uh, I use multiplexers a lot, okay, in my design. So uh, multiplexers are is very useful as a combinational circuit, and we can use it in large design. So um, what is a multiplexer? A multiplexer has uh, two to the power N inputs, 
So these are numbers D0, D1, D2. So we can put here 0, 1, 2. We can number these inputs up to the last input, which is 2 to the power n minus 1. In addition, it has n is the number of select inputs. So we can actually have select 0, select 1, select 2, etc. So we have actually up to n select inputs. And there is only one output, which is y. What does it do? Well, it does selection. So uh, this S input here is used to select okay, one of the inputs okay, of the multiplexer. Now, this is a multiplexer that has a large number of inputs, okay, large number of select inputs. But let us take a look at some real examples. The simplest multiplexer is a two to one multiplexer. This will be very simple. Okay. So if you have a two to one multiplexer, it means that you have two data inputs, D0 and D1. So we say that these are inputs zero and one. There is only one select input. So S here consists of one bit. <clears throat> S can be zero, S can be one. So if S is equal to zero, we select input D zero. So we say that Y is equal to the value of D zero. So we pass D zero from the input to the output. That's called selection. This is what the multiplexer does. If S is equal to one, then we select input D one. So now the value of Y will be equal to D one. That's actually also called selection. So we can describe this with an if else statement. So we can say that if S, if S equal to zero, then Y equal to D zero, else Y equal to D one. There is only one input S, there are two data inputs, and therefore S can be used to control this multiplexer to select whether the output Y is going to be equal to D zero or equal to D one. That's a two to one multiplexer. Now we can write a logic expression for Y, that would be also very easy. You don't even need a Carnot map, okay, for a multiplexer. You can just describe the logic expression by understanding the meaning of this if else statement. So notice that in software, when we write software, we write if else statements for selection, right? That's what you do as programmers. So when you are actually writing software, when you are writing programs, we use the if statement for selection. In the case of hardware, Hardware designers use multiplexers, okay, for selection. So the meaning of the multiplexer is used actually for selection. It's equivalent to the if statement that exists in software, but we are using the multiplexer when we are designing hardware. Okay, that's the meaning of the multiplexer. The logic expression is very simple. Okay, in the case of a two to one multiplexer, this is will be the smallest, the simplest multiplexer. The logic expression is given by y here. OK, so y here is my output. So we get y equal to d0. That's when s equal to 0. So when s equal to 0, you get the value of d0. So I end d0 with s prime. Because when s equal to 0, s prime will be equal to 1. And when you end d0 with 1, you get d0. On the other hand, you get d1 if s is equal to 1. Because if S is equal to one, okay, then S prime will be equal to zero. So D zero and zero will give you zero, or D one and one will give you D one. So Y will give you D one. So this is basically my logic expression for the output Y. So you get Y equal to D zero when S equal to zero. That's actually is S prime. So that's actually D zero and S prime, or you get D1 when S equal to 1. So it's actually or D1 and S. You see, this is basically the logic behind this expression. You don't even need okay, a Carnot map to obtain this equation. You can, of course, use the Carnot map, but you can obtain it directly okay, by thinking about the functionality of the multiplexer. So if you look at the truth table, the truth table is shown here. Um, this is the truth table for a two by one multiplexer. This is actually it's a two to one multiplexer. So if S equal to zero, you get the output Y equal to D zero. So D zero can be zero or one. 
Notice that we don't really care about D1. It does not really matter what is the value of D1. D1 is an input, but I don't really care about its value. So, um, so therefore, you get the output Y equal to D0. So if D0 equal to 0, you get 0. If it is equal to 1, you get 1. That's the output Y. Now, on the other hand, if S is equal to 1, as shown here, you get the output y equal to d1. So it is identical to d1. So if d1 equal to 0, you get 0. If d1 is equal to 1, you get 1. And we don't really care about d0. So that's, again, it is a condensed truth table. So notice that the x here can be like 0 or 1, okay? But we don't really care. It does not really affect the output. The output does not depend, okay, on this specific input. So therefore, you have here three inputs. We must have actually eight entries, but each row has a don't care. So basically, each one of these rows is equivalent to two rows when you expand the truth table. So this is basically like two. Here we have two. Sorry. So this is two. This is two. This is two. And this is two. So basically, you get actually eight entries in this truth table if you would like to expand. So notice that how we are using don't cares in the inputs to make the truth table more condensed. Let us take a look here at this uh, four by one multiplexer. Now, when you have here four data inputs, you can number them from zero to three. You need to have two select inputs. So the two select here are used to control. These are also inputs, okay, to the multiplexer. So notice that how I'm numbering them. S1, S0. These are the uh, select inputs to the multiplexer. So you can have four possible values of S1, S0. You can actually have 0, 0. You can have 0, 1. You can have 1, 0, and 1, 1. So 0, 0, the output Y becomes D0. If it is 0, 1, you select D1. 1, 0, you select D2. And 1, 1, you select D3. We can write this as an if-else statement. So you can see that we can think about it, okay, like also when you think about software, it's the same thing, selection, okay? We are using here a multiplexer for selection, and that's how we describe the output Y. So S1, S0, 0, 0, 0 we select Y to D0. 0, 1, we select D1. 1, 0, we select D2. Else here, the final else, it means 1, 1. So therefore, we select that Y is equal to D3. Now, the logic expression can also be, be, be obtained easily, okay? Logically, just think about this if statement, okay? So Y, this output Y, will be equal to D0 when you have the S1, S0 are both equal to 0 and 0. So therefore, we have to end with S1 prime and S0 prime. So when you have actually S1, S0 are 0, 0, then you have S1 prime will be equal to 1, and S0 prime will be also equal to 1, so you get the value of Y equal to D0, and the rest will be zeros. Now, in the case when you have the inputs is 0, 1, so you say that D1 must be ended with S1 prime as 0 prime. Sorry, S1 prime as 0. So S1 prime means S1 equal to 0, and S0 means that S0 equal to 1. So this is actually, as uh, this is basically 0, 1. You get the output here is equal to D1. If you have 1, 0, so D2 must be ended with S1, S0 prime. And in the case of 1, 1, D3 must be ended with S1, S2. So this is my logic expression for the output y, and we obtain this actually uh, just by thinking about what the multiplexer does, we obtain the logic expression. We did not even need to draw a Carnot map. So notice that this multiplexer has six inputs in total. We have two select inputs, and we have four data inputs. And there's always one output, which is y, okay? So for the select inputs, we can have zero, zero, we can have 0, 1, we can have 1, 0, and we can have 1, 1. 
So if it is 0, 0, the output y will be equal to d0, which can be 0 or 1. We don't really care about d1, d2, and d3. So we just put, actually don't care in my inputs. In the case of 0, 1, then the output y will be d1, which can be 0 or 1. And we don't really care about the remaining inputs. In the case of 1, 0, then it is d2. And in the case of 1, 1, we select d3. So notice that each entry here in this condensed truth table has three don't cares okay, for the inputs. So this will be if you expand this. So this will be like eight. This is eight. This is eight. If you, so each one of these condensed entries will be equivalent to eight entries in a normal truth table. So if you actually just count them, you have here eight times eight, you have 64. Because here we have six variables, two to the power six equal to 64. So these are 64 entries, but I'm just showing them as eight because this is a condensed truth table. Okay, that's the truth table actually for a multiplexer. Do you have any question about this? Uh, doctor? Yes. Uh, so we can say like the general equation for the multiplexer to represent the S as a sum of product. And add uh, and and uh, each term is the corresponding uh, input. Yes. Okay. Let me show you the implementation. Okay. So now we can take these logic expressions, and we can just implement them using gates. Okay. So uh, let us see how we can implement these multiplexers. Let me start with the simplest multiplexer, which is a two. Okay. It has only two data inputs and one select input. So that can be implemented like this, just using AND gate or gate and an inverter, OK? So that's actually here is this gate will be D0 and S prime. This is D1 and S, and this is basically the ORing. OK, that actually is the two uh, by one multiplexer. If you would like to actually to go to the uh, four input multiplexer, then this will be its implementation. So notice that I'm using here three inputs, okay, and gates, okay. So you can see that D0 is ended with S1 prime as zero prime. This D1 is ended with S1 prime as zero, and this D2 is ended with S1. This is S1 here as zero prime, and this D3 is ended with S1 as zero. And then of course we use a four input OR gate to produce the output Y. So that's this is basically how we can implement multiplexes using logic gates. That's basically how we can implement the multiplexes as a, as a circuit, as a combinational circuit. Now, notice that these AND gates are called enabling AND gates. Now, why do they actually call them enabling AND gates? Yeah, and suppose that here this S is equal to zero. So I'm going to say that this S equal to zero. If this s equal to zero, then the output of this inverter will be one, and here it will be zero because we are connecting s direct to the second uh, AND gate. Now remember that the AND gate, if one of its inputs is zero, the output is zero. Now here I'm ending d zero with one, so we get d zero. So notice that this AND gate is going to enable the input d0 and here i'm actually just ordering d0 with the zero you get the output y equal to d0 so notice that the end gate is enabling the input to propagate to the output that's actually when s equal to zero if s is equal to one then we can actually i want to enable d1 to propagate to the output okay so that's for the two to one multiplexer let us take a look here at the four input multiplexer. So we can actually have, let us say, the input here is one zero. So in the case of one zero, we are going to enable D2. So notice that if this is actually one, the output of this inverter will be zero here. The output of this will be zero here, right? Now, here it's going to be one. Okay, this is going to be one. This is actually S1. OK, and this is going to be um, and a zero. OK, is going to be inverted. So this is going to be also equal to one. Whereas here we'll have one zero. Now, because you have zero here, this will be zero. This will be zero. 
Here you have it's enough to have one of the inputs, for example, as zero equal to zero to get the output zero. Here you have one and one. So our ending D2 with one and one, you get D2 here. And therefore the final output Y will be D2. So you can see that these enabling AND gates are going to actually to enable one of the inputs to be to be propagated all the way to the output. And that's basically selection. So we're selecting one of the inputs, and this is what the multiplexer does. OK, I would like to show you uh, uh, a different way of implementing multiplexers using three state gates. I would like to show you how we can implement functions using multiplexers. So all of this will be covered in today's lecture. So the logic gates that we have studied so far can have one of two possible outputs. A gate can have an output which is either zero or one. And you get logic zero or you get logic one. These are the two possible outputs of a gate. Now, in the case of three state gate, it's called three state because it has three possible outputs. OK, so the outputs can be zero, one or Z. So now we have a third possible output, which is called Z. And the meaning of Z, it means that the output is in the high impedance. This is called the high impedance output. It means that the output is disconnected from the input. Now, an easy way to understand the meaning of the high impedance output, think about this, and this is how this is the symbol for the three state gate. This is how it looks like. So we have a C input here. This C input is used to control the gate. So if uh, C is equal to zero, then we say that uh, the gate is like an open switch and it can actually be open or it could be closed. So therefore, if C equal to zero, then the output is disconnected from the input and the output F is equal to Z. We can draw a truth table for that. Notice that here, if C is equal to zero, then the output F is equal to Z. And the meaning of Z, it means that the output is disconnected from the input. So this is the meaning of high impedance. So Z here means high impedance. Uh, so uh, electrically speaking, then there is no current going inside this gate. And therefore, you can think about the output as a wire which is disconnected from the input. Right. In the case of C is equal to one, then it means that we have it as a closed switch. So let me erase this and draw it here as a closed switch. So basically there is a connection from the input to the output. This is if C is equal to one. And we say that the output F is equal to the input X. So F is equal to X. So if X equal to zero, you get zero at the output. If X is equal to one, you get one at the output. So the output F is identical to the input X. So now we have three possible outputs. We have the output F can be Z, it can be zero, or it can be one. This is the meaning of tri-state gate. Okay. We can have variations of these uh, three state gates. You can actually have the C input to be inverted. Notice that I'm showing an invert and uh, a bubble here. Okay, or a small, a small circle here at the input C. Now, if uh, we use an inverted input C, then if C is equal to zero, then it will be a closed switch. Then the output F is equal to X. And if C is equal to one, so if this C is equal to one, okay, if this C is equal to one, then this will be an open switch. So therefore, there is no current which is passing through and therefore the output F will be in the high impedance if C is equal to one. So basically we are inverting, okay, the input C. So that's here, the control input here C is inverted. You can actually have it the other way around. You can actually have C is not inverted, but the output F is inverted. So it looks like an inverter here, but there is a control input C. So if C is equal to zero, 
we get the output is equal to Z. That's uh, the high impedance output. If C is equal to one, OK, so if C is equal to one here, let me write one. It will be a closed switch. So basically we are connecting the input to the output and therefore the output will be inverted. OK, so it will be like a closed switch, but the output is inverted. So this will act like a normal inverter. So here F is equal to X prime. So let me write F is equal to X prime. That's when C is equal to one. So when C is equal to one, the gate is going to conduct electricity and you get F is equal to X prime. If C is equal to zero, then basically the gate will be just like an open switch and the output will be disconnected from the input. So we say that the output is in the high impedance state or Z. We write it as Z. And finally, we have here, you can have both the C input and the output F are both inverted. Okay, yani I'm just showing some variations. Yani. Okay, some variations of the same three state gate. So if you have the C input is inverted, so when C equal to zero, then the output F is equal to X prime. So let me write here F is equal to X prime. And when C is equal to one, then basically F here will be in the high impedance state. It means that the output is disconnected from the input and it's like an open switch. OK. Is this clear? Do you have any question about the meaning of three state gate? So now this is a different type of a gate that we did not really see at the beginning of the semester. By the way, you can model this in Verilog. Verilog actually has a three state gate and you can use them in Verilog hardware description language. You can use this type of gate. Type. So now we understand okay, the meaning of three state gate. Do you have any question about this? Before I move on to how we can use this gate. Uh, doctor? Yes, Tadal. I understand like the uh, overall process of the gate, but uh, I don't uh, really get to what high impedance uh, represent or mean. OK, the meaning of high impedance, um, if you remember actually from physics about resistors or from elect from the, I don't know if you have taken a course about electrical engineering, about circuits, uh, if you would like to go to the electrical meaning of high impedance, it's like having a high resistance. OK, it means that there is no current that can pass, pass through or very little current that can pass through. So electrically, it means that as if the output is not connected to the input. OK, so think about it that no current can pass through the gate and think about the output as being disconnected as if it was a loose wire. It's not really connected to anything, okay, the output. And uh, this is the meaning of high impedance. So when I say the output is Z, it is means that it is disconnected from the input. There is no current that is actually going through this wire. And therefore, that's the meaning of high impedance. Um, so if you would like to think about the gate as a switch, think about high impedance. It means that the switch is open. So current cannot really pass through a switch if it is open. And uh, if it is a closed, it means that the gate is conducting and the current is passing through. You can actually have the value of F is equal to X. OK, or you can even have the output F, which is inverted, and you can actually get the value of F is equal to X prime, which is the complement of X. OK, that's uh, so this can be controlled by C. OK. Uh, so the meaning of C is used to control this gate. We did not really have this in normal gates. In normal gates, you can never have high impedance. The output is either zero or one. But in the case of a three-state gate, we have a third possible output, which is not zero, which is not one. It means that the output is disconnected from the input. Now you will say that how is this useful? I'm going to show you 
OK, in a minute, how we can use three state gates to implement multiplexes. But I wanted to explain the meaning of three state gate, and then I'm going to show you how we can use it okay, in the design of circuits or the design of multiplexes. So designers actually use this type of gate when they are designing, let us say, circuits or in they are implementing, let us say, multiplexes. Right. Uh, is this clear Hammam, now or do you still have ambiguity about this? No, it is clear, thanks. Anyone has ambiguity about this? Is this clear for everyone? Right. Um, let us see, OK, um, the meaning of wired output. Now, if you take two gates, let us say an AND gate and an OR gate. Now, these gates can have one of, uh, they can have only two possible outputs either zero or one, and you connect their outputs together. We call this wired output. So we're basically we are wiring the outputs of these two gates together. Now that's not really something which is good. You should never do something like this. You should not really take two gates and wire their outputs. Now, what is the problem of this? The problem is that if the output of the AND gate is zero and the output of the OR gate is one, what is the output F? In fact, if one gate is zero, is logic zero, and the other one is logic one, then you have a short circuit from the power supply to ground, and there will be a high current going from one gate to another, and this high current is going to burn the gates. So basically, you are destroying the circuit this way. So you should never wire the outputs of these of any two gates. OK, you should not really use wired outputs. So you cannot really have wired outputs because this is will result in a short circuit especially when you have, for example, one gate is driving its output high, yani yeah, logic one, and the other one is driving it low. So basically there will be like a high current moving from the high to the low, yani yeah, from the OR gate to the end gate. And of course this current is passing through these gates internally without going into the details how this is actually implemented. And this is going to destroy the transistors that exist inside. So basically you are burning your circuit. Okay, so for this reason, we don't really want to blow these gates. We don't really wire the outputs of these gates. Okay, now this is for normal gates. However, so you see that here I said that don't do this. Okay, however, if you use the three state gates, you can wire the outputs together. That's really the idea of using three state gates because you can control whether the output is connected or disconnected from the input. And you look at, for example, these three state gates. Now, if you can guarantee that at most one of these gates is enabled and the other two are disabled, you can never have a short circuit because you can guarantee that the output is disconnected from the input. So you can, if you can guarantee that at most one three state gate is enabled at a time. So we have here, these are controlled by C1, C2, C3. So if at most one of them is enabled and the other two are disabled, it does not really matter that which one, then basically you can actually guarantee that there is no short circuit. Now, how is this useful? Well, we can look at the truth table of uh, this uh, circuit here. So look at the values of C1, C2, and C3. Now these are used to control uh, the three state gates. So 0, 0, 0, it means that the, all of these gates are uh, disabled and therefore their outputs are disconnected from the input. So the output F will be Z, high impedance. It's not connected to anything. If you have one zero zero. So now here you have, this is, is a closed switch. Then the value of, and the other ones are open switches. Okay, so this is open, this is open. 
okay, while C1 is equal to 1, then you get the value of F is equal to X1. Now, if on the other hand, if C2 is equal to 1, and C1, C3 are both 0 and 0, you get the value of F equal to X2, you are connecting the input X2 to the output F. And if you have it as 0, 0, 1, then basically we are enabling, okay, uh, the third uh, uh, gate while disabling the first two, then the output will be X3. So basically I can select whether the output F is equal to X1, X2, or X3 based on C1, C2, C3. Now this is if at most one of them is enabled. However, if you enable two of them at the same time, like here in the last four cases, we are enabling two or we are enabling three, then this is going to burn the circuit. Okay, so we should not really enable two, three state gates at the same time if their outputs are wired. Okay, so that to avoid to have a short circuit and burning the gates. So we, we can connect the outputs of, we can wire the outputs of uh, three state gates as long as we can guarantee that only one of them is enabled and the others are disabled. Okay, so we can use the upper part here of this truth table. I can use this part, but I can guarantee that we will never have two or three enabled at the same time. Okay, two or more. Okay, enabled at the same time. Now, this is good because I can use this to implement multiplexers. I can implement a multiplexer using three state gates and the decoder. Let us take a look at this two to one multiplexer. Now, this two to one multiplexer, I can actually connect D0 and D1. These are my data inputs to Y. Y here is my output. Now, notice that here my output is wired. This is a wired output here. You can see that how the outputs are connected together to the same output. So this is wired output. As long as I can guarantee that only one of these three state gates is enabled at a time and the other one is disabled. Now, how can I guarantee that? Well, I can use a one to two decoder. So if this S here equal to zero, so let me write here zero for S, I'm using an inverter here then the output of this inverter will be one. And here I'm connecting S directly to the second, okay, three state gate. So the upper gate will be enabled and the second one will be disabled. So therefore this will be a closed switch. This will be an open switch. And therefore the value of Y will be equal to D zero. That's actually when S is equal to zero. And when S is equal to one, then the upper three state gate will be disabled. So basically the inverter will make the uh, C input equal to zero, while the second one, the, the one which is shown below, is going to be uh, enabled. So it's C input is equal to one, and therefore we get Y is equal to D1. So basically we can use these uh, three state gates with wired output to select whether the output Y is equal to D0 or D1. Notice that this inverter, which is used here, can guarantee that you will never enable both three state gates at the same time. Only one of them is enabled and the other one is disabled. And this is good. So we can actually do it by design. We can ensure that only one three state gate is enabled at any point in time, at any given time. And therefore, this way we can select the output Y to be either D0 or D1. So this is an implementation of a 2 to 1 multiplexer using three state gates and an extra inverter. The inverter here, you can have two outputs, the one which is inverted. So here you have S0 prime. So you have, sorry, S prime, and this will be S. So basically you can connect S prime to the uh, upper three state gate and you can connect S the same wire can be connected to the second three state gate. So this is a one to two decoder. So you get the output to be either one zero or zero one, depending of course on S. Okay. Any questions about this? So that's basically an implementation of a multiplexer. Before that, we used actually uh, 
and gates, uh, or gate uh, and inverters to implement the multiplexer. So we have seen now more than one implementation for a multiplexer using traditional gates and or and inverters or using a three state gate with a decoder. Let me show you another example. This is a four. This is a four to one multiplexer. It has four data inputs. It has two select inputs as one as zero. So I can implement this using four three state gates and it two to four decoder. So now here as one as zero will be decoded. So this will ensure that exactly one of the outputs of this decoder will be equal to one and all the other outputs will be zeros. And for example, if we had here one zero, if as one as zero equal to one zero, then you get the output two is equal to one and these outputs will be all zeros. So the nice thing about the decoder is that you have exactly one of the outputs equal to one and all the remaining outputs are equal to zeros. So therefore we are going to enable this three state gate. The other ones will be disabled. They are actually here open switches except for one and the value of Y will be equal to D2. That's what we want. We would like to select one of the inputs. So therefore we would like to connect one of the inputs to the output. And this is a multiplexer. So we are using here three state gates and a two to four decoder to implement a multiplexer, a four to one multiplexer. That's the idea of using three state gates for implementing multiplexer. Okay, questions about this? Students? Are you learning or are you <laughs> sleeping? I'm sorry to say this, but I, I really need to hear you. I need to hear you. You are not really raising questions. Raising questions is really good. This is what I really would like to see during my class. Now I would like to see interaction. I don't really want to talk to myself because I know this material. I want to talk to you. Bye. Uh, I'm sorry. Sometimes yeah, I, mean, I'm, I say something like this, but yeah, I mean, please raise questions. This is what I really, really would like you to do. If you don't understand something, interrupt me, raise questions. OK, I really I, I, I really like to see students raising questions. Right. So now let us see how we can implement large multiplexers. So we can use small multiplexers to build large multiplexers. This is really the idea. So we can build them hierarchically. OK, so this is called hierarchical design. Using small multiplexers to build large multiplexers. For example, I can use small two to one multiplexers to implement a four to one multiplexer. So now this is here. I have here a four to one multiplexer, which is implemented using three two to one multiplexers. So you can see that here my inputs are D0, D1, D2, D3. The output here is Y. I have two select inputs S1 and S0. Notice that S0 here is the least significant bit of my selection, and S1 is the most significant bit. And for example, if S1 is equal to 0, I can select either D0 or D1. If S1 is equal to 1, I can select D2 or D3. And then we can use S0 to select between D0 or D1 or between D2 or D3. So that's an implementation of a four to one multiplexer using smaller two to one multiplexer. This is another example. This is how we can build an eight to one multiplexer using two four to one multiplexers and a two to one max. So if you look at this, uh, uh, this diagram here, now that's an eight to one multiplexer. You can see that we have eight data inputs, D0, D1, all the way here to D6 and D7. So these are eight inputs and we have three select inputs. So we're using S1 and S0, okay, for uh, the four uh, uh, to one multiplexers. I'm using S2, notice that S2 is the most significant, but I'm using it for the last multiplexer, okay, to select the final value of Y. The output here is Y. Now, this four to one multiplexer can be implemented as shown here to the left. So basically, we can implement the four to one multiplexer using a smaller two to one multiplexers. So basically, you get a tree of multiplexers. 
That's really the idea of implementing large multiplexers. Now, each small multiplexer here, for example, two to one mux, for example, this one can be implemented either using the end or and the inverters, or we can use the, the three state gates to implement it. And there's more than one choice to implement the multiplexer. This is how we draw the symbol of an eight to one multiplexer. So we draw it like this, but inside it, OK, that's the symbol of one eight to one multiplexer, but internally we can implement it using smaller multiplexer. OK. So now we understand OK, how we can build multiplexers, OK, how we can implement them using either normal gates or three state gates or how we can use small multiplexers to build larger multiplexers. Let us see how we can use multiplexers. Uh, I'm going to show you how we can use multiplexers to implement functions. Uh, but before I do this, uh, uh, we can also have multiplexers with vector input and vector outputs. Yani for example, even though this is a two to one multiplexer, notice that input A consists of M bits. So these are M wires, the same thing for B. OK, and the same thing for the output Y. So the output Y can be either A or it could be B, but we are selecting M bits, not just actually one bit. So here my inputs and my outputs are bit vectors. Notice that S here can be zero or one. Zero means that Y becomes A. One means that Y becomes B. We are selecting B. You can also have here a four to one multiplexer using here four data inputs. These are all bit vectors. M minus one down to zero. So basically here my inputs consist of M wires and the output Y also is a bit vector consisting of M wires. Notice that we are using here only two select bits because we only have a four to one multiplexer. So we can select one of these four inputs. OK, now in order to implement something like this, it's very easy. So if you have, for example, M bits OK, in my inputs and my outputs, then we can implement this using M copies, M copies of the two to one multiplexer. So think about this here multiplexer as having in parallel M copies OK of the two to one multiplexer. It's actually will be easier to draw it like this, but we understand that this is not just one multiplexer, but these are M copies of the multiplexer. We have one multiplexer for each bit of A, B and Y. So we have actually one multiplexer for bit zero, then another multiplexer for bit one and so on. So we have M bits, so we have M copies. OK, the same thing here. We have M copies of the four to one multiplexer. So we can draw it like this when you are using with when you would like to select bit vectors. And yani the inputs are not just uh, single bits, but bit vectors. You can actually select bit vectors. 